All right, guys, so, so Pike B, let's get to the Latin Americans. We're talking about uh, export. We are on page 192, and we drop down about five lines from, from, the, from the top. Okay, so let's read a bit. Let's see what happens. But the point to make up front is that here we see Italian neorealism becoming directly politicized. Right, so for the first time it really, it was always political in orientation, it was always a political response to, to its context, but here it becomes directly politicized. So let's take a look, five lines from, from the top on page 192. This change in the rules of filmmaking was of profound importance to filmmakers in Latin America, who were themselves trying to resist both Hollywood cinema and domestic national film industries. From the mid 30s to the mid 50s, production in Argentina, Brazil and Cuba, the countries in which I will focus for lack of the space even to gloss the whole story of the new Latin American cinema, consisted mainly of genre films adapted from Hollywood models. So again, all that was happening in South America was that repetition. They were simply replicating the American model. And we said always, especially when it comes to contemporary South Africa, you should think about that too. The video that we produce, do we do our own thing or we do, do we just simply replicate pre-existing models? Yeah, so that's what these guys were doing in Brazil, in Argentina, in Cuba. They tended to just replicate the uh, American model. Argentina, the largest producer of films adapted from, uh, sorry, Argentina, the largest producer of films in Latin America before World War II, had its gaucho films in Brazil, its chanchadas, popular music comp uh, comedies. The Vera Cruz Company, with studios in Sao Paulo, was created in the 40s to make films that would compete on the international market. But it hired, for the most part, foreign technicians and filmmakers, and of course then also the influence that they brought with them. The self-titled New Cinema arose in the late 50s and 60s in reaction to the state of affairs following the 59 revolution in Cuba and in the wake of neorealism. Several of the filmmakers at the forefront of the movement studied in Italy. So there's an interesting, very direct link between the Italians and the Latin Americans. So a direct link for export. Uh, studied in Italy. And many acknowledge the direct influence of neorealism on their work. We will see, however, that Latin American filmmakers soon rejected neorealism and felt the need to go beyond it to create a realist cinema of their own. So remember we said, yes, there's a direct export at times from the Italian neorealism to Latin America and to Africa, but as it reaches those contexts, it gets transfigured into something else. So it becomes something new again, right? It isn't just Italian neorealism copied by Latin America or copied by Africa. It inspires those two continents of filmmakers in those continents, but they do their own thing with it. And sometimes they go further with it like these guys did, right? And these guys, the Latin Americans, made it expressly political. Okay, uh, unlike the Italian neorealists, they wrote manifesto upon manifesto proclaiming their political and aesthetic goals. So as we said, very direct. Establishing a theoretical framework for an inquiry into the nature of cinematic realism. There were many direct connections between Italian neorealism and the new Italian uh, and the new Latin American cinema. Biri is going to be one of the big names now associated with this new Latin American cinema. Studied in Rome at the Centro Sperimentale di Cinematografia in the early 50s, as did Guterres Alia and Garcia Espinosa. Right, so it's going to go through some of these names. Uh, Biri is really the big one that we want to take, that uh, we, we give a little bit of focus to, but we're really just working through these guys too to get to Africa. Unfortunately, we can't cover them in any great detail, uh, as interesting as they are.
We can jump over to page 193 at the top and you'll get a bit more information on those linkages. Uh, take a look. Two lines from the top on page 193. Guterres Alia had said that from the beginning of the revolution, our artistic foundation was in fact essentially Italian neorealism. One line down, Dos Santos also claimed that without realism, we could never have begun. Right? But that's the idea, begun, right? So they took the framework, they were inspired by it, but then they went further, or they transformed it to their own context, so it becomes something new again. It isn't just a repetition, it isn't just a replication, it becomes something new as it transfers from one context to the uh, other. Right, uh, let's see what else they've said. You, this is going to sound familiar at this point, you would have heard this from the Italians. Um, blah, 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 uh, two lines down or so, we're still on 193 at the top paragraph, two lines down from where we last were. Here's Dos Santos again, Neorealism taught us that it was possible to make films in the streets, that we do not need studios, that we could film using average people rather than known actors. There were many reasons for the importance of neorealism. Latin American filmmakers uh, were working outside of and against any dominant studio system with a comparable lack of resources. The only kind of film they could possibly make would be a low-budget production using post-synchronized sound and no movie stars. An Italian director showed them that, the, that this was not only possible, but that it was also laudable. In other words, it was also desirable. Okay, so then there's a few names listed at the end of the paragraph of some of the big films uh, are made within that school of thought, and you can just take a look at that. But not too important for us, we're more interested, and we are getting to that uh, uh, African context. 194, four lines down from the top, uh, in manifestos and theoretical texts from the 60s, Latin American filmmakers advocated a revolutionary cinema that was both art and action. Very important. It was both art and action, and there they mean political action. A transformational social practice, an instrument of change and consciousness raising. So this is almost kind of like a Soviet in orientation. It's directly political. right? It's directly political. The Italians were more... Uh, they had a political orientation, but it was a bit, it was more, it was more muted, it was more sophisticated, it was a bit more nuanced. These guys were expressly political. We can jump over to 195, four lines from the top of 195. Uh, Lotman's description of neorealism's poetics of refusal seems to apply to the new Latin American cinema as well. A neorealism itself joined the refused background of cinema art of the opposite type. Prior national cinemas were also rejected, also in the name of a more authentic reality and realism. Biri, there's that name again, a theorist, documentary filmmaker, teacher, and founder of the Escuela Documental de Santa Fe, argued that earlier Argentinian films had presented unreal and alien images of the country. And you want to really circle that and focus on that. You want to focus on his argument. Previous Argentinian films had shown unreal and alien images of the country. So if an Argentinian was watching an Argentinian film, they wouldn't recognize the Argentina that they were seeing on the, the screen. Right? And we have to think about that too when we think of any South African production. Even if it's something as silly as a soap opera. Right? Think about something like Generations of Silver the Lion. If you're watching that, and you know it's filmed in South Africa, and you know the context is South Africa, and it's meant to be a South African story, but do you recognize the South Africa that is represented in those soapies? Right? Think about that. Uh, what, what version of South Africa are they portraying? Uh, is it in any way authentic, or is it unreal and alien? 
So anyway, he said, yes, so Argentinian films were producing these unreal and alien images of the country. And we keep reading. And, and the task of the new documentary was to provide a true image. Uh-oh. By showing how reality is and in no other way. I said uh-oh because whenever you see somebody make this, this uh, claim to truth, you have to be a little bit suspicious. Right? Sabiri said we are the ones that are going to provide the true image of Argentina. But how can we trust them? How can we believe them? How can we know that they're that they are not being influenced by their own particular ideological biases? So we have to be very wary of that sort of claim. Anyway, he carries on by testifying critically to this reality, to the sub-reality, this misery. Cinema refuses it. It rejects it. It denounces, judges, criticizes, and deconstructs it. Biri concluded that the task of the filmmaker was to confront reality with a camera. Right? Confront reality with a camera. And to document it. Filming realistically. Filming critically. Filming under development with the optic of the people. Right. So, this transformation of reality is what these guys are after. It's expressly political, and they are influenced by the Italian neorealists. But most importantly, when Italian neorealism comes to Latin America, yes, it inspires them, but because the context is different, it transforms into something different. And now we are going to see precisely the same thing happening in Africa. Okay, and that's going to be part C.